Well, friends, today we're going to be thinking about the topic of the return of Jesus. And I think that sometimes when we think about the return of Jesus, the judgment day, the day of the Lord, however you want to describe it, that there are are two possible ways that people sometimes go. There are some people who get really into it. Who sp- we want to spend a lot of time thinking about all the details, about all the prophecies through Scripture, all the, all the information that you can possibly dig out going through all the prophecies, the Old Testament, all the New Testament, particularly the book of Revelation, I think. And people will be poring over that and trying to work out the times that we are in. And are we in this part of this cycle? Are we in the time where we should expect to see this beast coming out of the sea? With is that the one with the seven heads or the three, and uh, the horns and the different things and what's going on? And people can be fully into end times prophecy and understanding the times that we live in. And is this war that's uh, going on in Ukraine? Is that a sign that we're coming to the end? Some people can go full on one way. And I think that there are other people, perhaps in response to that and seeing some people so full on, that can go the other way, not really wanting to think too much about the return of Jesus, not really wanting to think too much about the end times because, well, it all seems a bit too much. I'll just sort of put that over there in the too hard basket and not think about it at all. Now, I think there are problems both ways, in particular if we we don't want to think at all about the end times. I think you can go too far in terms of being so caught up with it. But if we don't want to think about the end times, that's a bit of a problem because if we're Bible people, the the return of Jesus and the end is spoken of uh, a fair bit in the scriptures. And even where it's not about the end specifically, about the return of Jesus specifically, There is also a lot in there that talks about our hope and our future. And if we never want to think about what the future will hold and what it will bring, then we're not really thinking, concretely at least, about the hope that we have as believers. And so I think it is appropriate for us to to spend some time, as much time as the scriptures spend on, on thinking about the end times, the return of the Lord, the day of judgment, if you like. And so the passage that we're looking at today in Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, I mean, if the whole of the, the letters to the Thessalonians has a bit of an emphasis on the hope and the return of Jesus. This chapter is a bit of a deep dive into the topic of what will happen when Jesus returns. We've already seen something uh, that, The apostle has to say in 1 Thessalonians, the end of chapter 4, beginning of chapter 5, which I think was helpful. It said that, uh, told us some of the things about what we can expect when when Jesus returns. You may remember the four R's. But this particular chapter is written again in response to Paul's concern for the Thessalonians. You remember that uh, Paul and his colleagues had, had founded the church in Thessalonica over a visit of less than three weeks. And, and so the church was this baby Christian fellowship going through all sorts of challenge, not least the challenge of persecution and opposition of outsiders, who, uh, which included the Jews, but also no doubt the pagans who, who wanted to sort of stamp out this new faith that was just sort of taking root in their city, in their town. And so the, the church had to face that opposition but they also had to face another kind of opposition, if you like, a a sort of opposition that had come in to the church through various teachers and people claiming to have teachings that sometimes they claimed that they had a word directly from Paul or perhaps they claimed that they had a word directly from the Spirit. And so Paul, in writing this second letter back to the Thessalonians, is not only concerned about how they respond to the external opposition, but he's also concerned about how they respond to various what he calls false teachings. In verse 1 there, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, he says, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or word of mouth or by letter, 
asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. The particular false teaching uh, that's going to potentially lead the Thessalonians astray or cause them some distress or alarm uh, or, or anxiety is this teaching that Jesus has already come. Now, it might seem a bit weird that there's people teaching that Jesus has already come. You would think it would be obvious. If Jesus had come, we'd all know. And when you read Paul's other teaching, it, it should be that obvious, that we will know when Jesus returns with the angels on the clouds and, and all the things that he, he describes in the first letter. But there are some people who can come up with a teaching that suggests that Jesus has already returned. You just need to be able to understand the significance. You just need to see the signs that he's already returned. And people who have that particular false teaching will have some way of, of, uh, of gaining a particular response from people because they say Jesus has already returned. Now, I mean, there, there are people who will say Jesus is never coming back and there are people who want to go into all the details about what will happen before Jesus comes back, but Jesus has already come back. It seems a bit weird. Except that there are people around today who will make that claim. And the classic one, which I saw quoted in a little commentary by, by uh, John Stott, are the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so this is what Stott writes. He says, their founder, Pastor Charles T. Russell first taught that the world would end in 1874. And then, I guess when that date passed, he revised his calculations to 1914. Now, after that year passed, his successor, J.F. Rutherford, asserted that Christ did in fact come on the 1st of October 1914, but invisibly. On that day, he exchanged an ordinary seat at the Father's right hand for the throne of his kingdom. So no parousia, that is return, of Christ is to be expected. Rather, parousia means appearing. No parousia is to be expected. It has already taken place. What's interesting about that is there are sort of elements there which, when you look at what the Bible says, are things that have happened. The, the idea that Jesus takes a, a seat at the right hand of the Father, um, a throne next to the Father, you know, that's, a, that's an idea we do get from Scripture that Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God. But that he's not going to come back, that he's not going to return, seems a bit weird. In fact, it is. It's a bizarre teaching. How you get that from, from the scriptures where there is so much that is said about Jesus' return is hard to fathom. But I guess in the early days of the church where there wasn't much written teaching around to, to go on, that was something that could be raised up. What Paul says to Thessalonians is, don't be alarmed by that. Don't fall for this particular false teaching. He says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For, and then he goes on to explain why they can be sure they haven't missed it. That is the return of Jesus. He says, for, the, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Now, Paul goes on in verse 5 to say, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? Uh, and it just makes us think, well, there's plenty of things that we might not understand fully because we weren't there when he was first explaining them. But he is making clear that the day of the Lord isn't going to happen until, first of all, the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. He's talking about a rebellion against God. He's talking about a rebellion against Jesus. People who will reject the Lord and will lead others to reject the Lord. In fact, people who will oppress and, and persecute believers. That's the sort of rebellion that is uh, likely to happen. And what he's saying is that there will be one particular person who will sort of be the leader of this rebellion. And that particular person he calls the man of lawlessness. It sounds pretty ominous, doesn't it? He's the, he's the bloke who is committed to no law. 
And that seems to be his, his trademark. That seems to be how you can really recognise him. He is committed to rejecting the law of God. He'll be committed to uh, undermining, at the very least, the scriptures. And I say undermining because what, the way this is suggested is that he actually will be potentially somebody who comes from within the church. So he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, verse 4, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. He's going to be opposed to all religion, not, not just Christianity, not just Judaism, which is where he seems to, to come from, but he'll be opposed to all religion because any, anything which is committed to obedience to God, even if it's a, a, a false religion, maybe he'll encourage false religion because it leads people away from worship of the true God, but he's going to be very unhappy with anybody who, who sees their uh, commitment to the Lord first above, well, above him and his religion. And when you put it that way, it starts to sound a lot like the, the way that the emperors in ancient Rome thought, that the emperor was not just the leader of the empire, which is pretty impressive in itself, but the emperor was actually a, a, an expression of God. The emperor was a God who ought to be worshipped. And so in, in the ancient Roman culture one of the first things that people were expected to do was to worship the emperor as a god. Now you can see how that is something which the early Christians found pretty tricky and often led to their persecution, often led to their suffering. But it wasn't, of course, just restricted to ancient Rome. There have been all sorts of empires that have come up since that have expected people to have their commitment to the leader as number one. I wonder what you're thinking of as I, as I mention that. You're thinking of Hitler's Germany, Stalin's Russia, or Soviet Union rather, okay, Putin's Russia. <laughs> Belief in the leader as number one, as the, the one who is the saviour of their nation, at the very least, perhaps the saviour of the whole world. Hitler, after all, talked about the thousand-year Reich, the reign of a... a his, his empire for a thousand years. It's big claims that people make, but that's the nature of those who, who set themselves up as God. Now, I said before, the, the interesting thing about this particular Antichrist is that in setting himself up as God, he sets himself up in the temple, it actually sounds like he could potentially come from within the religion, from within church, the church. Now, setting himself up in the temple is something that could actually have happened when Paul wrote this. It's probably written in the early 50s AD. The temple wasn't destroyed until about 70 AD. And actually, in those years, there were occasions when the Romans did set up things in the temple to be worshipped in place of the Lord. But, of course, ever since the destruction of the temple, you can't set yourself up in the temple. But you can set yourself up in a temple, various ways, but when we think of the temple of God, as the, as the Bible does, as the people of God, the church, then this could be a leader of the church. And so through the centuries, people have seen the man of lawlessness, potentially, as a leader of the church. Some have pointed to popes at various points and said, he, that's him. He's the Antichrist. He's the man of lawlessness. Uh, Antichrist is sort of the term that John uses in his letters for this one, the Antichrist. Interestingly, John also talks about many Antichrists will come, those who are opposed to, to Christ and his people. And I, I tend to think that's the way we ought to understand this as well. There'll be many lawless ones who'll come along and set themselves up, but will this particular lawless one be the last one, the one who is going to come just before Jesus returns? Well, I think the way that we'll know that is by how far he goes. Because what we see is that during the time of this rebellion, the, the lawless ones 
and this particular lost one as well, will be held back. As things get worse, there will still be some limitation to what the lawless one does in opposing God and opposing his people. Uh, Verse 7, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, again, here's, here's where people start to get into all the details. Who could be this one who's going to hold it back? Is there some great mighty fighter for the cause of, of God that's going to hold back the lawless one and some secret society that's going to do it? I think the most likely one who holds back the power of uh, lawlessness is the Holy Spirit. It's God himself, isn't it? Whether he uses people, whether he uses the church, whatever he uses... I think the way that he does it is a spiritual way through the faithful preaching of the gospel, for, through people faithfully living in obedience to God. The opposite of lawlessness is obedience to the law. And if we take that broadly, obedience to Christ. And as people do that, then in a sense, they're holding back the lawless one. But we're told the time will come when he, the, that holding back force, if you like, will be taken away where the lawless one will, in a sense, be told, be given free reign. And what's going to happen then? We would expect it to be a terrible time that would last, you know, who, who knows? I mean, if it lasts a week, if it lasts a year, if it lasts 10 or 100 years, it would be just terrible for God's people. Is that what's going to happen? Well, let's come back to that one. What's it going to be like? when the lawless one is at work? What are the dynamics of the rebellion, if you like? Well, the dynamics of the rebellion is it's going to just be the way that Satan normally works. In accordance with how Satan works, verse 9, he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. That's the usual way that Satan works. He... He uses lies. He uses lies to make us doubt the goodness of God and his word. He uses lies to to make us think that obeying God is is a way for us to miss out. He uses lies that lead us away from the truth of God's word. And so he's always seeking to undermine the word of God and to undermine it not only in our minds but in our hearts as well. I can't trust God that I will be blessed if I keep on following him and obeying. I need to go elsewhere. That's the way that Satan works. I mean, the, way, the other way that he works, of course, is by signs, false signs and wonders, false miracles, if you like. But as it says here, these are just fakes. If we base our faith on miracles, on seeing sort of tremendous signs, and there are some people who who make such an emphasis of that in their churches that they say that's what's going to convince you to follow God, well, we need to be aware that Satan can show signs in that way, fake signs, signs that serve the lie, signs that that serve to lead people away from the Lord. These half-truths and deceptions are the way that Satan works. And when the man of lawlessness comes, whoever he is and however many of them there have been sort of little ones in the lead up, they come with all the power of Satan to deceive people. And he does deceive people. He deceives perhaps many people and leads, uh, deceives those who are perishing, as Paul says there in verse 10. But why do they perish? Well, they perish, he says, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. They refuse to love the truth. What Paul is saying here is that judgment is real. The judgment day is coming and there are some who will perish on that day. But the reason that they perish is because they refuse to love the truth. They refuse to love God. They refuse to put their faith in the truth of Jesus. Because if they did, then they would be saved. 
It's as simple as that. Now, as, as Paul goes on to say, those who refuse to believe the truth, well, God sends a powerful delusion and all these lies of the evil one that, that harden them. And they continue to reject God. But the reason is because they refuse to believe. They refuse to believe the truth, but delighted in wickedness, as it says there in verse 12. They believe the lies. And so, friends, that is why the truth is so important. Knowing the truth and and sharing the truth is so important because it's what keeps people away from the judgment. It's what brings people to faith in God and eternal salvation. It's the truth of what God has done for us. It's a Jesus. And that's why it's so important that we know the truth and that we share it. Now, the thing about this, of course, is that all this talk about the rebellion coming and the terrible times for those who, 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 who want to put their faith in God and all the opposition, the man of lawlessness and his, the restraints on him being re- removed at the end time, it, it could quite be terrifying, couldn't it? I know for some people it is so terrifying that they sort of freeze up and they, they have incredible anxiety about the coming judgment day. I mean, think about some of the terrible things that people have had to suffer and imagine it being worse. It's frightening. But I said before, that the thing that Paul says here, perhaps, which is the most encouraging thing in our thinking about the day of the Lord is this and, and what leads up to it is this. What he says there in verse 8, <clears throat> where he says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendour of his coming. So what Paul is talking about here is the return of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, and the re- revealing of the lawless one just before it. And is there going to be some great mighty battle between the two? You know, the great toing and froing that's going to go on for a thousand years of fighting it? No. The Lord Jesus overthrows him with the breath of his mouth, just like that, puff, one puff of breath. The lawless one seems so strong and powerful, perhaps he's going to have a thousand year reign or something. He's like a dandelion. I went looking for a dandelion, but I couldn't find one, they're so frail. You know what, a dan- you, know what you do with a dandelion, don't you? Especially when you've got young children. You get them to blow on it and see what happens. It's gone. The lawless one, the great representative Satan, is about as powerful as a dandelion. And Jesus overthrows him with a puff of his breath. He's nothing. We, we're not meant to fear the lawless one. He doesn't have any power, really. Only what God allows him, up to a point. And when the time comes for him to be removed and for him to face the judgment, Jesus will overthrow him with a puff of his breath. Friends, this is meant to be an encouragement. It's not meant to get us worried about what's going to come and can we survive these difficult times. Not meant to get us trying to work out whether there's going to be a seven-year reign between when the the church goes up into the air and and Jesus returns or something like that. There's various millennial views on things like this, premillennialism and postmillennialism and stuff. Um, I, I just want to say, if you're wondering, I think it happens like that it's at the same time. There's not a period. Because the lawless one comes, he's revealed who he is, and Jesus immediately overthrows him with the puff of his breath. It, it will all happen. And we will see that Jesus is Lord. That God is sovereign over everything. That even the worst things that have happened in this world, God is still sovereign. Because he will put them right. He will hold people to account. Those who deserve judgment will have to face judgment. No one gets away free. But of course, those of us who have come to God for mercy and grace will receive Forgiveness and salvation. That is what Jesus has won for us. That's what he's done. So that when he returns, we will be caught up with him. Together with those who have gone before us, we will be caught up with him 
and be united with them and with him in the air, as it says. That's something that we can look forward to. It's not something that we have to fear. And Paul is confident, uh, just briefly, that the Thessalonians will persevere in this. He says, uh, verse 13, We always ought to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, through belief in the truth. He's confident that because they've put their faith in God, that they will be saved, not just now, but eternally. That God will work in them by his Holy Spirit, sanctifying them, helping them grow in holiness. And that God has called them through his gospel that they might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the hope that we have when we put our faith in Jesus, that we'll share in his glory when he comes. The day of the Lord can be a scary thing. We think about it as the day of judgment, the day when Jesus comes and wraps everything up, but it's also meant to be a great and glorious day because we'll share in it with the Lord. And so Paul finishes this little section of his letter anyway by encouraging the Thessalonians and encouraging us to stand firm and hold fast to the teachings that he passed on to them, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Friends, in this, in this little chapter, Paul is helping us not only to see some of the details about what might happen before the return of Jesus, about the man of lawlessness and how his power has been held away, but he's also encouraging us to see that God is sovereign over it all, that we don't have to worry. I, have, I know people who, when they're thinking about all these different views about the end times, they think of themselves as pan-millennialists. That is, they're happy that it'll all pan out in the end. Well, maybe we can give it a bit more thought than that, but I'm sure that that is the truth of what Paul is saying here. God has got it in his control. It will pan out in the end because God is sovereign. The Lord Jesus is going to come back. He's going to bring judgment for those who, who deserve it. But for those who have put their faith in, in Jesus, we can look forward to that day with hope because it will be the great and glorious day in which we get to see our Lord face to face and we can enjoy that. We can rejoice to see him and to see our brothers and sisters with him. Friends, this word of Two Thessalonians is an encouragement that we can have hope that is sure and certain for our eternity. Let's praise God for that, shall we? Father God, we do thank you that in your mercy you speak to us about the things which might be difficult, the things which might be hard in this life, and that you encourage us that they are all in your control. Father God, we pray that now as we listen to your word again, as we reflect on its significance to us, that you help us to believe what you have said. Help us to trust you. Help us not to be caught up by the lies of the evil one, the lies of the man of lawlessness who, who seeks to undermine your word and your truth in our hearts. Father, help us to trust you in everything that we might indeed be caught up with you on that great day, that we might be able to rejoice in the salvation that you have won for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.